So we've been asking this question as we've been teaching through this uh, series on worship. What do you treasure? And as I've thought about that, um, well, that's a that's a hard question to ponder and come up with. But I uh, I finally have identified uh, some of that, and I and it takes me back to uh, when I was a younger man and in my twenties and thirties and so. And I I really um, treasured what do people think about me, and uh, it was really important. And that kind of drove a lot of what I did is is the opinion of the people because I just wanted to be liked. And as I grew in my spiritual journey and began to really be committed to following Jesus, one of the things that it kind of uh, moved into is I wanted to live a life that counted. I wanted to, I really wanted to please God. And so that was something that was just very strong in my mind, in my life. It's just, I want to please God. And if I say that to people who are followers of Jesus, they go, man, that is really a good treasure. That's really a good focus. And, uh, and yet I will say that uh, there is a, a dark side to that. You know, um, when I really think about how that played out in my younger uh, experience, uh, the desire to please God really uh, led this, this uh, effect that when I felt like I was pleasing God, it led me to pride. And when I felt like I wasn't pleasing God, which was a lot of the time, then I was uh, defeated. I was uh, felt like a failure, and shame and guilt often was what uh, absorbed me. And uh, this also, uh, this dark side also was that it it replaced God as the judge and put me in His seat, and so I was very judgmental of myself. I was very judgmental of other people, and uh, I, you know, I was just I was critical, and I I lost out on just experiencing life. I just thought I had to be God on earth and and do His job, and it all came down to um, you know uh, just just a, a very miserable life, and suddenly um, it seemed like over time it I. I I came to an awareness that I was this self-righteous Pharisee. And um, God graciously intervened. Uh, I was in the ministry at the time, and uh, I stepped out of ministry. And for a long uh, journey of, of transformation, I began uh, to, to kind of find my way back. But in this time, I was, I was angry with God. I had sacrificed, I had given uh, several years of my life, and it just seemed like that I was working for a God who could never be pleased. Uh, I, I was, uh, uh, this pleasing God became uh, this work for God attitude, and uh, it just was not working out. In fact, um, it really came to grips, I really came to grips with this reality, what was going on when uh, it occurred to me that this um, that my life was so miserable and so disappointing in this relationship with God, as hard as I was trying to please Him, that I uh, just came aware one day that this is not good news. This wasn't, you know, the gospel is supposed to be good news, and I was not experiencing good news. And that was uh, a big turning point in my life. And um, I will just say, please, you know, the, the, the pleasing God, the working for God, got in the way of being a worshiper of God. And so I want to uh, unpack a story for us today as we look at the heart of a worshiper. And uh, we're going to be looking in the, uh, the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to be looking at a story there. And little background to this. Uh, Jesus in this chapter has been healing um, uh, people. The lame is walking. The, the blind are, are seeing through the miracles that he's doing. The, uh, uh, the lepers are, are being cleansed. The dead are coming to life. And people are being forgiven and are being changed through Jesus' miracles and through his message. And it says here in uh, verse 30 of, of this chapter 7, 
But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves. So here's a story that, uh, that just followed Jesus' big major work. And we come to this story of, um, of this Pharisee inviting Jesus. And here's what it says. Um, One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went, Jesus went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So we don't really know who this Pharisee was. There have been Pharisees like Nicodemus who wanted to spend time with Jesus, but he often did that in private. Uh, But this Pharisee has invited Jesus into his house. We don't know if he was trying to set him up or if he was really seeking. And Jesus um, obliged. He he uh, showed up, and uh, what kind of the picture, when we think of eating at a table, we think of sitting in chairs and, and sitting around a table and eating, but it says here, and, um, and reclined at the table. And so you, the reclining is something that I would normally do in my living room, on my, <laughs> my easy chair, my recliner. Uh, so th- what this kind of, this, the culture of the day was that you would have a lower sitting table and cushions around it, and you would lean with your feet out. And so you can imagine this table of people with, um, that are leaning in, having the meal while um, their feet are away from the table. And you can imagine, too, that they wore sandals and all that they would walk through with the donkeys and other livestock down, walking down the road. So you would probably want your feet to be away from the table. Uh, so they're away from the table, and, and uh, behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus uh, was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. So this, la- this, this woman of the city um, learns about this, and, uh, and she brings in this flask of an alabaster box. Alabaster is just a stone jar that uh, was holding the ointment. And, um, and she kind of, she's this uninvited uh, person that is showing up, and this is how she resp- she came in, and she's and standing behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair um, of of her head and kissing her, his feet and anointing them with the ointment. So you can imagine she's she just she just barges in uninvited and. Um, and begins to go to Jesus' feet and weeping and uh, washing his feet with her hair and, and pouring oil. And uh, if you were sitting in that, around that table, you, it would be a pretty awkward, awkward scene. Uh, the, the Pharisees in the room would be um, wanting to take her and throw her out. She's a sinful woman. Uh, we don't know what, you know, uh, much about this this particular gal, but we do know that she was known in the city to be sinful. So there were things that she was doing outwardly. The people know that she was a part of the gossip in the community, but here she was with Jesus washing his feet, and Jesus was not responding like they thought he would, that he would kick her away and, and put her out. In fact, I'm surprised that those around the table didn't get up and, and remove her. But here she is. She's come and she has moved uh, by, uh, by Jesus and has, has come uh, to this place. And I, I truly believe that, um, that she perhaps has had an encounter before this time and maybe was seeing some of those miracles, uh, heard the message of Jesus and, and received Christ, and, and then uh, has come in as a way to uh, just to, to thank him with gratitude. And then it goes on, and... Uh, Verse 39, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, and I want you to think about it. He said to himself, he did not say this out loud. He said to himself, if this man, Jesus, were a prophet, he would have known and what what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. He is thinking in uh, about if just I can imagine he's just sitting there and, and looking at this whole situation. He's astonished at what he's seeing of this woman coming in. He's, he's, he's really surprised at Jesus' non-response. 
uh, that he did not get up, that he did not, he's allowing this to happen. And he's thinking in his mind all these thoughts when, and Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And I think Simon is there and all of a sudden it's like, what, what? And did Jesus know what I'm thinking or whatever? But uh, obviously Jesus did, and which, is a, which is a miracle, which is a, a, a point where, where uh, uh, Simon has an opportunity to see who this Jesus is. And he says, uh, and, uh, yeah, say it, teacher. And a, Jesus begins to tell the, uh, the story. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 Darani and the other 50. Now, Darani is about a day's wages. So one had 500 would be about seven months, and uh, 50 would be about, you know, two months of, of wages. When they couldn't pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will, ha- will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, from whom the he canceled the largest debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then Jesus turned to the woman who has been washing his feet and he starts talking to Simon wherever he was placed at the table. And he begins to challenge Simon to this. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for your feet, but she has wept, wet my feet with her her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is is forgiven little loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus has two main things that he is presenting. Number one, those who have had the greater amount of sin forgiven are most aware and more grateful to be worshipers. And then he talks to to Simon about uh, his attitude. Jesus came in as a guest. A guest would normally come in and have their feet washed before going to dinner. Um, They would be treated at least as as equals. But Jesus is explaining that, Simon, I came into your home. I was not, my feet were not washed. You did not respond anything in uh, the politeness, or even the culture of the day, and yet this woman, who you would regard as somebody that shouldn't even be in the room, has treated me with honor. And in response, Jesus was, you know, challenging Simon, but treating this woman with honor because he allowed her to serve as she did. And I think about just the fact that... that. Uh, uh, you know, Jesus was taking the point that really was what he was saying was actually pretty humbling in challenging Simon for how he was uh, responding and how he was was uh, living and it, and really was an opportunity for Jesus to show who he really was. When he said, your sins are forgiven, he's claiming to be God. And those around them had the opportunity to see Jesus and hear that and respond either No, you're not who you say you are, or yes, that is, I'm being impacted by what is going on. Well, as we think about worship, as we think about Jesus being our treasure, our definition that we're working for is a, worship is a treasuring of God above all things that overflows into acts of glorification. A treasuring of God above all things, that overflows into external acts of glorification. So I want to take just a moment and I want to kind of work through 
the, uh, some of the points that I pull out of this passage, and I'm really looking at what is the heart of a worshiper. And the first thing I want to observe is that this sinful woman, this woman of the city, um, she knew who Jesus was. Uh, she came barging in uh, to this room, not caring about what people thought. Uh, what she really cared about, what did Jesus think? What could I do to somehow show my gratitude? Again, I think she was had heard and, and been around Jesus, had um, had come alive in the message of, of, of the gospel, and she was coming not to seek Jesus, but to thank him and respond in an in a aspect of worship. And uh, so uh, she knew who he was. She knew that he was the all-knowing, the all-powerful, the holy, the righteous God. And uh, she was not ashamed. She was not she was going into uh, these Pharisees who uh, she knew how they treated her out in the street and coming into the Pharisees' home was, uh, was, a, was a huge deal. But she went in anyway. You know, I think about um, this treasuring Jesus' presence. I see the Simon, he didn't treasure Jesus' presence presence. He did invite him to the room, but he wasn't, he didn't treat him as a, uh, with, with any honor. And I wonder how it is that we spend time with Jesus and treasure his presence. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that many are more comfortable with God being afar than being close. Uh, we are, uh, we we uh, we struggle that God would know all things and be that close, intimate uh, relationship that I believe God desires for us to have. And I was uh, meeting with a uh, a gentleman recently, and um, this is a uh, we were talking, and 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 I asked him a question as he was struggling. His his issue was he. He's been a follower of Jesus for a long time, but he just cannot get around or grasp the fact that God could forgive all the sins that he has done. He's done, you know, this man was sharing how he just, there's just so many sins, so many things that he's so ashamed of, and he just cannot get around the fact that God would forgive him. So I said, uh, what would it, I want you, I want you to, to, um, I want you to, 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 to put your place, uh, think about the most peaceful place that you can think of. And we were talking through that. And, and I, so I shared, I, one of the most peaceful places for me would be that if I were to, to be sitting on, uh, near the beach, looking out over the ocean, and uh, just a beautiful day, it's um, pleasant, and I'm sitting with peace. I don't have cares in the world. I'm just, I'm sitting there enjoying uh, myself and enjoying the moment, and a table is sitting right there beside me. And uh, I said, "So here we are sitting here." I said, "What would it be like if Jesus came and sat down at the table?" And this gentleman said, "Oh, well, I, I think I'd have to get up and leave the leave the the area." And I said, "Why is that?" He said, "I I just struggle with the fact that." He's, he could sit with me as somebody who is so, uh, have, ha have done so, so wrong. And as we continue to talk through that, and I, I just helped him understand a little bit more of who Jesus is and what he has done and, and walking through his salvation and some of the truths. And as he came to grips with that, he began to cry as he allowed Jesus to actually sit at the table with him, tears welled up in his, 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 his eyes and his mind, and he just began to, uh, to weep that he could uh, spend that moment like that, to have a, a, a closeness. And I think about, uh, you know, in, in your life, what do you experience uh, that moment of worship. Worship is is to be able to sit with God, the, to to be with God, and and to 
uh, enjoy his presence. Uh, Ephesians 2 says that we are presently seated with Christ in heavenly places. See that we are already close with Christ. In Ephesians 1, it says that Christ lives in us. There is this closeness, and yet it's hard for us to get Jesus to the table. But when you can get to Jesus and be able to uh, enjoy his presence far and near, uh, that's true, true worship. And also, the heart of a worshiper is overflowing gratitude. We see this, uh, this woman that comes in and she not only knew who Jesus was, she knew what Jesus did and could do. She saw her need Nobody had to tell her. She, everybody always told her. She knew her need. And when Jesus forgave her, oh, what great news that was for her. I believe often that many never see their depravity. If you don't see your depravity, you can't experience that wonderful grace and the forgiveness. In my story, as I was sharing at the beginning, uh, I was 40 years old and working for God. I was always that good boy. There's a lot of things I didn't do, and I was proud of it, maybe prideful of it. But disappointment and failure was shaping my life. Miserable because I never felt like God was pleased. And I had a picture now of God who was a God who could never be pleased. And so hopeless, helpless, guilt and shame filled my heart. And I woke up over time to understand how much in need of a Savior I needed. Even though I had, had Christ in me, I did not have that closeness and I did not really know and over the, those, that period of time, I saw that I was capable of, of any and every kind of sin, and that broke my heart. But it began to be the breakthrough for me to see God for who he really was, that God was a, a God who was already pleased, that God was a God to be worshipped. And I began to relook at the scripture and, and remove the the cloud of, of uh, misunderstanding and read how he, I had an unconditional love that God lavishly gave me his grace, that forgiveness was, was there for all of my sin, that security forever in Christ. And I, the, the joy and the peace that flooded in me. I remember going through that time and I was so much about focusing on pleasing God, and I would always this, have this idea of working for God. And, and I just told myself, never again will I say, work for God. What I have replaced that with is, I am here for God to work through me. And boy, that has been a game changer for me in how to live a life as a worshiper. You have, a couple of weeks ago, Jason and Jordan were sharing on, uh, and, and Jordan shared about this cup and how often the cup was, was, was leaned over. And that was my working for God. I was always trying to fill that cup and somehow make God pleased. And he talked about flipping that cup up. And I, I just think about God is pouring down in uh, his love, his grace. And how do you, re how do you fill your cup? Just every day, allowing God to love you. Um, John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons and daughters of God. And sometimes we think of receiving as the beginning of the journey of salvation, but receiving is a daily life to receive God's love daily, receive his forgiveness daily, to receive his, uh, his grace daily, and, and just be reminded of what he has already done. And when you do that, you're saying, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. And you're receiving that love and that, that, that cup that feels full and running over. So a worshiper is 
enjoying the presence of Jesus. They're overflowing with gratitude because they reminded of what God has done. And it's just like the, the woman that, that could not keep it back. It was so powerfully overflowing. And then lastly, worship is a joyful submission. This gal did not maybe see and understand uh, what was really happening to the degree in her coming and, and giving it her act of worship, but it was an opportunity to, to, uh, to proclaim the gospel. It says in the verses that follow, then those who were at the table with Jesus began to say among them, themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you go in peace. So those sitting around the table were brought to the gospel to, a, to the point of a decision. Are you going to believe that this is the Jesus who is forgiving this woman and there have a demonstration of worship of someone who has changed and they can see joy that they didn't see days and weeks before they saw sorrow to, to humility and, and that God would receive her. What a stark reality to what they understand God to be. But the gospel was proclaimed. And as I think about this woman that, that came in this proclamation of the gospel, her humility didn't save her. Her tears didn't save her. It wasn't even the expensive ointment that she poured out that saved her. It was her faith that saved her. You know, for 20 years, I worked for God to be pleased that I would somehow do enough as his child to get his favor, uh, not realizing that, I was, that God was already pleased with me. And when I came to understand that, that moved me from a worker for God to a worshiper of God. I live in gratitude as opposed to trying to get something now that I know I already have. And I hope that, that if you're experienced anything like my initial journey with God, that you would come to understand uh, that God loves you. He's already done it. Salvation is finished, and God has a wonderful, wonderful plan for you. Worship Him. We'll dismiss to our campuses. So, in, as we as we kind of ponder through this uh, this passage, this message, are you a true worshiper of God? Uh, do you have the heart of a worshiper? And I would just kind of go back to that illustration that I was sharing about the gentleman that I walked through that uh, opportunity to, to really experience Jesus sitting at the table. And what do you experience, or what would you experience with Jesus coming and sitting at the table? Would you relish that? Have you come to the place where it's like, oh, yes, I'm learning how to enjoy the presence of Jesus in a very close and intimate way? Or are you at a place where it's like, oh, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I could sit there. The other thing I want to have you think about, this is something that we've shared many times, and I just want to walk real briefly through my story, that um, I was full of anxiety, worry, and fear, and I was controlling my life, even though I had given my life to Christ. And, and <clears throat> as I shared the early part of my story, that I, who, who did I, think that I was, I thought I was a child of God, but I had to somehow please God. And it was up to me. It was my, the ball was in my court. I had, to, I had to make something happen. And what has God, what did I believe God had done for me? I believed that he had saved me, but I also believed that he was loving me conditionally, that he, hasn't, he hadn't fully um, loved me. I, I had to prove it. I had to somehow pay my way and who was God in that time? Well, God was disappointed. And I always felt um, just not quite in the relationship. 
and God was always afar. I had to, I, I, that's a confession. That's who I was. That's what I was believing. And repentance was, was going through the process of, uh, of proclaiming what really was true. And I came to a greater understanding through the years of who God is, still learning that he is this wonderful, wonderful God. And who is God? Well, God is, um, is pleased. When I think of God, I think of, of, of a God with a smile on his face. And boy, that just warms my heart. He, he is, the Jesus Christ has done the work and I am being changed and trans, uh, and, 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 uh, just uh, transformed by him. What has God done? God has uh, accepted me. He's forgiven me. He's adopted me. He loves me. And who am I? I am a child of God, loved unconditionally. And so as you think about your story, here's a tool just to walk through. This is not only a tool for your whole story, it's your tool for your day. I just have to work through this daily because I continue to have the wrong perspective of who God is and what role I play. So I hope this will bless your heart as you walk through it. Let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for your love, your grace. Thank you that you're a God who has incredibly uh, taken sinful people like me and you have allowed us to be part of your family. You've invited us to be your children. And, the, and Jesus Christ, his death and burial and resurrection has, has given us an opportunity to be adopted as your children and to be whole and righteous and blameless. And, uh, and it's not because of what we've done. It's about what you've done. And, uh, and the simple re- requirement is that we would walk by faith, and believe what you say to be true. So I pray that those who are listening will, will say yes to you. Yes, that I, and, and come to believe what is true. That even hard to believe, it's true. And so God bless those as we think about and respond to this message. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and I Hope that um, this message has impacted you today.